All right. So I'm honored, uh, as I was saying, to have Dr. Adrian Sibro here, albeit remotely from the University of Texas at Austin, where he is Assistant Professor of Media Studies. Dr. Sibro will be presenting on the research that culminated in his 2023 Rutgers University Press monograph, Scratchin' and Survivin', Hustle Economics and the Black Sitcoms of Tandem Productions. The shows that this book spotlights are ones that are indelibly etched in television history and in Americans' cultural memory. I'm sure I'm not alone in thinking so. And yet their production histories had not been adequately explored, nor had their legacies been thoughtfully assessed until now. With all due respect to the late Norman Lear, Tandem's co-founder and hallowed Emerson alum, it gives me particular gratification to host Dr. Sebro, who in working to set the historiographical record straight, has contributed a much needed reappraisal of this era's media, industrial, and cultural landscape. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sebro. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming out or being here uh, virtually with me um, and everyone else on this uh, Tuesday. Thank you for giving your time. I really appreciate it. Extremely thankful for the consortium. Uh, Venetius and um, Maria, thank you for having me out. Ken, looking forward to hearing your comments. Uh, just greatly appreciate um, being asked to be here and talk about this work. Any chance I get to talk about this work is a uh, I'm very thankful for. Uh, it was a culmination of a lot of uh, years of development and to see it, see it in physical form as a book presented to folks uh, is something that's still very surreal to me. So I don't take that for granted at all. Um, and you entered what you started with a, a good point, um, Maria, that I wanted to actually bring up with like, I also, you know, it's not lost on me that obviously, you know, with Emerson being the sponsoring university here uh, of this event and, you know, um, normally you're being an alum of Emerson, as well as normally his recent passing, all these things are pretty timely with this book coming out, I think just a month before he passed. So of course, I, I was um, I was bombarded by a lot of, uh, uh, I woke up to the messages of it, right? Um, I talked to New York Times about it, talked to many folks about it, and a lot of folks asked my perspective on it, right? And I think that the book tells a lot about it because it is a matter of, of course, giving honor to the work that, you know, was produced through the tandem as a whole. So not just Lear, but Bud Yorkin as well, but the tandem as a whole, as well as, you know, making, you know, Lear not the center of it. I think oftentimes when these histories, he is at the center, which, you know, uh, importantly so, he uh, helped construct and, le and led way and gave an avenue for these work, this, work, this work to, to exist in the world. But um, other folks' were, uh, careers were at risk in this moment as well, too. And other folks also were part of this larger narrative of creating TV for the masses that talked to a different community. And I wanted to give them honor in this book. Um, so I was originally writing an op-ed uh, actually about, you know, Lear's passing. And I did want to kind of share the introduction with you all before I get into today's talk. Um, a pioneer, an innovator, and a rule breaker, Norman Lear left an indelible mark on American television. Without him, so many Black stories would have never seen the light of day. But the documented legacy of his creative work often leaves out the labor of so many others that were integral to construct in tandem. We applaud him as a champion of prog progressivism, liberal consciousness, and comedy, as we should. However, we must also acknowledge his setbacks, where his vision may have fallen short, his unflinching control, and the ramifications of those who dare to challenge him, successful or not. Like Hollywood used black exploitation films to save their cash-strapped studios from going under, or how the Fox network in the 1990s used black center stories as a niche to propel the network to relevancy, once profitable, black storytelling was abandoned. When constructing stories about blackness from outside of it, relying solely on genre schematics and the mundane for profit ignores the lived reality of the culture which you're wishing to uh, display. The inclusion of voices that live these realities is crucial to the legacy we see these shows in now. His hustle, as it were, was built on the transformation of black bodies and voices striving to make their stories heard amid the precarity of a brutal television industry. So with that, I'm going to uh, start my presentation about Scratching and Surviving, Hustle Economics, and the Black Sitcoms of Tandem Productions. So let me get this started for y'all. So uh, with Rutgers University Press, Scratching and Surviving, Hustle Economics, and the Black Sitcom of Tandem Productions is a production history and study of Black labor in the Black Sitcoms of Tandem Productions, Sanford and Son, Good Times, and the Jeffersons. 
These sitcoms challenge auteur theory or subjective producers' control of 1970s television given by the financial interests and syndication rules. And these rules uh, prohibited networks from financial interests from TV programs beyond their first run exhibition. Focusing on these black sitcoms, Scratching and Surviving engages the intersections of performance, production, politics, and reception to consider how this array of black sitcoms intervened in both the history of television and in the rearticulation of black identity in the early 1970s. With close attention to race, socioeconomics, gender, and politics, the sitcoms of tandem had their own distinct style in depicting black American life on screen. More than a lyric from the hit sitcom, Good Times, the phrase and title of this book, Scratching and Surviving, represents black struggle, fight, and scraping to gather resources by any means necessary in order to stay alive and leave a mark in an uncertain world. Whether through Sanford and Son, Good Times, or The Jeffersons, these shows chronicle black characters who represent struggle, racial, societal, or economic, uh, loss, and sometimes triumph for the persistent scratching to stay alive. The Black artists who embody these roles off screen must also scratch their way through the, the white hegemony at tandem and the television industry at large. In efforts to tear away at the status quo and build anew, these deliberate efforts to rework and restructure television were often met with the loss of employment, gender discrimination, blacklisting, or simply silencing. Scratching and surviving forefronts the hustle, scratches at the surface, and recenters these narratives of dissent giving those who have the burden of rep representing their race the acknowledgement they deserve. Although they may not have had authoritative power in television production, the legacy of these Black artists has survived and altered the television industry, blazing a trail for the heirs of Black television representation to follow. So again, it's a, uh, this book is a production history and study of Black labor and the Black sitcom Montana Productions. Um, as far as source material, uh, a lot of it was found in the archive using oral histories, um, through um, television Emmy videos that were recorded, through um, an archive of fan letters or hate mail, contracts, production materials, and scripts. Uh, the product attends to representation through production history and textual analysis. So actually, what we see in the paperwork surrounding the, the company and business of Tandem, what we see in the scripts, and what, what, what may be written in the script, but may, may be different from what we see on tel on screen. And also what are the, the performance on screen? How are people, how are these individuals performing these roles? When do they ad lib? And where are these motions where they make these characters their own? As the title of the book suggests, throughout I'll be using the term hustle economics um, to define particular practice and performance of labor, black women's embodiment and descent of tenant productions. So the breakdown of the chapters are my introduction, I approach how Tannen Productions became a company in and of itself with the start with the connection of Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin. And then I go chronologically talking about Sanford and Son, Good Times, The Jeffersons, and a conclusion of surrounding how these shows, the actors and within and artists within, not just actors, how they led way for uh, shows to follow in the future. So Hustle Economics. As the title of this book suggests, throughout I'll be using the term hustle economics to define particular practice and performance of labor, Black women's embodiment, and dissent at Tandem Productions. These intersections are utilized strategically as they make it clear that there are specific ways Black cast sitcoms are constructed as a counter to white casted ones. Surveying the history of Black sitcoms and their content, I found that these three intersections, hustle economics, uh, Black women's embodiment, and creative dissent, are constantly negotiated within, the out within and outside television production space. I coined the term hustle economics to speak to the specific ways black sitcom characters and artists engage with hustle economics, excuse me, engage with economics and labor, methods that are often the antithesis of their white counterparts. Hustle economics are negotiated and racialized under the table, catch as catch can, and sometimes illegal methods working class blacks to use to survive financially. Hustling is a rhythm of the working class black experience. The strategies of getting by financially and surviving are cast differently as felonious or informal when blackness is involved. Throughout this book, I address the spaces at Tandem and its black cast sitcoms where economics is raced as a hustle. It's not only, excuse me, it's not just on screen where hustle economics are present. I use the term to also describe the negotiations that take place in the production of blackness in these shows, combining research from recorded oral histories, interviews, employment contracts, I make clear that Black artists struggle to negotiate higher salaries and more producer or writer credit in their scripts. The Black artists at Tandem had to hustle in these various ways to navigate through the company's racial hegemony. 
keeping their jobs and have a stake as auteurs in the representation. Hustle economics helps to understand the labor of black artists specifically as they forcibly maneuvered through television and that tandem. So more on the term hustle, it came from this, um, this chart that's in the um, kind of, if you, if you do television studies work, you read this, uh, it's called The Meaning of Memory by George Lipschitz. It talks about early television and um, ethnic identity and how it was kind of formulated in early TV sitcoms, particularly looking at um, the shows on the left, Mama the Goldbergs, Amos and Andy, Honeymooners, et cetera, all this time, these shows of the early 50s, early and mid 50s, particularly I'm looking at the Amos and Andy section when it comes to the ethnicity of the show, of those in the show, it's black. And when it comes to occupations, um, it's kind of casted as cab driver and hustler. And to me, that I found that very interesting because I think of shows like The Honeymooners, right, where you have bus driver and sewer worker. However, the get rich quick schemes and um, hustling that's done in that show isn't considered hustling. It's considered simply for laughs, making it clear that when it comes to the um, get rich quick schemes or finding ways to gain money outside of traditional employment is race and termed differently when it comes to the ethnicity being black versus white on screen. So the idea of like a hustler or the idea of how we look at uh, two to come from the same era and define them differently based off of race, something as simply as like these get rich Chris schemes that are part of kind of any construction of early sitcoms. Um, when you look at it from a black perspective, it is, is deemed as more derogatory or negative rather than a, a simple means to stay alive. So I particularly looked at the term hustle and I complicated that to really reclaim it as a, as a, as a way of scratching to survive. Uh, oftentimes that has to do with hustling. And we see that on screen or, and off scenes as well from those black folks who are working um, in television industry. So just some of the books that are a huge part of, of course, much more, but some of these books are just a huge part of uh, the work I did and I working from them and with them and in contention with them. So I wanna always give honor to the those who have kind of led the way for me to realize that television can, can be something that we even study. Um, you know, I, I didn't believe it until I, you know, first read work by Robin Means Coleman and Crystal Brinzuk and then Christine Aikam, of course. Um, these really set the foundation for me to realize that I can, use comedy, use television, and use the sitcom as a means to talk about Black identity, culture, economics, and um, really what it means to survive in a space that wasn't built for you. Well, I first want to set the quick stage about television history, what's happening in this moment that even leads us to Tandem Productions very quickly. So um, in 1967, uh, the government's responding to uprisings throughout the U.S. So these uprisings, some may call them riots, lootings, uh, whatever they may be, uh, I've called them uprisings or rebellions in which many black and brown communities throughout the U.S. are uprising regards, with regards to, um, of course, the largest one was with regards to in 1968 with Martin Luther King being assassinated. It caused huge uprisings throughout the U.S. and mainly black and brown cities. But prior to that, these uprisings also occurred uh, when um, at points where uh, civil disobedience, well, like, well, police misconduct was happening throughout the U.S., especially in areas such as like Watts, California, and where you saw many folks rise up and take it and take you know control of their own communities when they felt that police power was trying to control them. And in, the, in these spaces, they had you know their their nearest hospital was ten miles away. There's no job corps in their area. Um, there's no safe schools for their children. So black folks reached a boiling point. With this boiling point came a string of uprisings throughout the U.S. So in the moment, President Lyndon Johnson created what was known as the Kerner Commission. And in the Kerner Commission, it was all about uh, finding ways to, or the Committee on Civil Disorders, all about finding ways to um, limit or, you know, stop these uprisings from happening as a response to the civil unrest. And with that response became a year-long research study talking to Black communities throughout the U.S. about what is it that you want, really? Or, what, or largely, what is it that's going to um, stop these uprisings from happening, right? And it came through a 400-page document, talked about healthcare, education, um, access to jobs, uh, welfare systems, uh, churches, et cetera. But one huge part about the Kerner Commission report that came following this uh, large research was how Black people were represented on television or lack thereof. And largely what that meant was Black folks were asking for a more equitable view of themselves on television, behind the scene, the screen, the scenes, as well as on screen. So, here's part of the Kerner Commission report that talked about uh, the failure of reporting racial problems in the U.S. 
So I'll, I'll, I'll largely kind of look at the right side of this, but particularly uh, equal, I'll read at length, equally important, most newspaper articles and most television programming ignore the fact that an appreciable part of the audience is Black. The world that television and newspapers offer to their Black audience is almost totally white in both appearance and attitude. So here it's very clear that um, the Black folks interviewed here are, are, are have an issue with the fact that the reporting of the news surrounding their neighborhoods isn't told from their perspective or their voice. They're largely left as the kind of those in the background when folks are reporting on them rather than them being a part of these things as well. So what this did was create a, um, a large issue and a large uh, um, space where Black folks felt that their voices weren't heard. And if you're not heard, you're constantly ignored. Of course, you're not going to be catered to as far as government referendum policy and access. Another huge part about uh, Black folks and their, and their issues with the media, I'll read from again from the right side as well. Um, this was a pleas. These were like pleas from um, Black communities uh, to the gov national government saying television should develop programming which integrates Negroes into all aspects of televised presentations. Television is such a visible medium that some constructive steps are easy and obvious. While some, some are taken, they are still largely neglected. For example, Negro reporters and performers should appear more frequently and at prime time. Hence the focus of this work. These are all prime time television shows. And news broadcasts, weather shows, documentaries, advertisements, and at the bottom, Negroes should appear more frequently in dramatic and comedy series. Moreover, networks and local stations should present plays and other programs whose subjects are rooted in the ghetto and its problems. So very clearly seen here, this commission uh, was given the, the layout of what, what, what's being asked for. What are Black folks looking for? How can they feel a sense of inclusion in America? A lot of it has to do with how the media is covering them and how they're being covered by them. And what is their stake in covering their own communities? Um, even with these pleas, the um, the committee, Lyndon Johnson, for instance, actually uh, felt like everything was being blamed on, on white citizens. So he kind of denied this large 400 page document. But at this point, it had become a national bestseller. Martin Luther King had endorsed it before he passed. He was assassinated. And at that time, once this is, is uh, throughout America as a bestseller, you saw many small um, fellowships or financial companies start to put money into local programming for Black communities, um, as well as programming of television shows on a public sphere come to play. So first you saw things like Black Journal and Soul. Uh, these are known as, you know, public interest uh, television shows, uh, national shows that kind of cater to Black politics, Black art, poetry. So these shows were the ones we see a public access, you know, uh, today's version of PBS, NET was um, National Education Television. So because of the current report, you saw a lot of black shows being funded by different uh, foundations. So black folks can have a way to talk their own politics and speak about black life in America. You also saw, you know, some popular primetime shows come about, specifically Julia, The Mod Squad, Room 222, not to be confused with The Cosby Show, The Bill Cosby Show. Um, so these are all shows that were a part of extending what Black identity looked like on TV on a primetime level. But still, majority of these shows, the Black character was the uh, was the one who was the larger, if to use the word token, um, they were largely existed in majority white worlds. Uh, but it was a step towards seeing Blackness on screen. And that, was, that wasn't really, um, the Blackness on screen in totality really wasn't covered until we reached uh, Tandem and um, Norman Lee and Bud Yorkin. So Norman Lear and Bud Yorkin uh, largely came together as two white Jewish men who worked together on the Colgate Comedy Hour in 1955. From there, they would work together in small um, ventures and uh, a lot of films like Cold Turkey. Um, and they realized that television actually is their foray. And particularly the largest television show that got them prominence was All in the Family. That is the show that, you know, um, with its dominance over television, really gave Lear and Yorkin complete control of television throughout the 70s. And especially in this moment of uh, financial and syndication rules where they're played, I believe, almost 80 percent of the production of, of uh, profits from their shows. They really had a complete control over who's hired in Hollywood and over like, you know, um, what networks are going to continue to play their shows. So they actually had at one point five shows in the top 10 of Nielsen ratings, and they had shows on both the top networks, CBS and NBC. Uh, but their shows at the time were on the family through CBS and Maude, uh, Maude in 1972, also on CBS. So with those shows came about, the shows I focus on in my work, Sanford and Son, Good Times, and The Jeffersons. And all these shows are hugely important to 
the construction of black identity on television and, and throughout largely throughout the world because these images these shows traveled uh tim havens his great book called black television travels to show that these shows were extraordinarily popular throughout the world because this is how the world viewed what black america looked like which is in some ways is a, a beautiful thing but in a lot of ways it's, it's a huge you realize the huge political power that tv has to construct an entire identity through three three shows right so um I take these shows seriously because they were the barometer of how the world is going to see blackness. So Sanford and Son it quickly is a story about a, a widow, a widower and a son. They own a, a junkyard in Watts, California. Uh, Red Fox is a starring character of that show. Good Times, a larger family in um, South Side of Chicago living in a project. North, excuse me, North Side of Chicago living in the projects. And The Jeffersons is about up, upperly mobile. Um, I would say... Um, I would say rich, upper middle class, more than more than upper class. I would say rich, actually. Family, newly rich, um, fish out of water narrative, um, starring Sherman Hem Hemsley and Isabel Sanford, kind of blackness entering white spaces, right? And these were the shows that represented black identity through tandem, all through the same images as these two created these, these shows, right? So I want to make it clear uh, when I come to these case studies, I'm going to do two case studies for uh, for my discussion today about two particular actors in these shows. But I wanted to make it clear that, you know, the issues that may have been at, at, at stake in these um, different spaces at Tandem weren't just arbitrary. They were very real and, com and, and discussed throughout a lot of uh, media at the time. Specifically in TV Guide, we see this 1974 image called No Laughing Matter, TV's Funhouse Mutiny. So again, Tandem runs things here in this moment. But uh, there's a lot of issues at Tandem. Uh, a lot of folks had issues with somehow Norman Lear had a kind of complete executive control over every aspect of Tandem when it came to scripts, when it came to who's hired. And you have this little caricature here where the stars of their three shows, Carol O'Connor of, of On the Family, uh, Bill Macy of Maud, and Red Fox of Sanford and Son are kind of, you know, creating a, a devil-like imagery surrounding, you know, the boss who was Norman Lear. But what's told about this is so interesting because it, it's largely told the story of the men who had issues with the working environment and their perspective. Black women or women in general, largely their stories about being in tandem aren't really discussed at all. So I wanted to take the time today to discuss those from two individuals, one being LaWanda Page, um, who plays on Esther on Sanford and Son, and I have a pin here and representing of her, and Roxy Roker, who plays Helen Willis on The Jeffersons. I wanted to give a uh, two stories about how I talk about them in the book and how they're so important to um, the imagination of what blackness can be, what it looks like, and how important they are to constructing tandem in a way that um, that is uh, really extending what black identity is. So Wanda Page, I call this section the radical ambiguity of the Wanda Page. Before her fame as the religious conservative on Esther on Sanford and Son. Paige garnered notoriety and honed her feisty demeanor through her fire-breathing and serpent-dancing vaudeville performances. Later, she harnessed that stage presence through her solo comedy albums as a member of the comedy group Skillet, Leroy & Company, the Los Angeles-based Laugh Records. With few Black women comedians gaining notoriety at this moment, much of their comedy was relegated to male-dominated, sexually explicit, and socially irreverent blue material or party records. Black women have been forced to utilize the stand-up, especially blue material, space to annihilate heteronormative prescriptions of racialized and gender sexuality. As comedy challenges social and cultural mores, Paige, as Lawanda, the queen of comedy, utilized comedy to challenge the symbols rampant in popular culture that ignored Black women's sexuality and desire by distributing those symbols head-on, deconstructing societal norms of Black women. Although Paige held her own on Sanford and Son as on Esther when it came to balance between her and Fred, it was ultimately Red Fox's show. As the queen of comedy on the, on the stand-up stage is where Paige excelled on her own. Although Paige produced two solo albums before her time on Sanford and Son, the albums after her Sanford and Son fame are where she was able to lean into the stardom of this new audience base and where Paige saw her audience grow from a Black in-group community to the mainstream. Yet her authentic Black voice remained. Through Sanford and Son, Paige, as on Esther, was able to add complexity to the images and representations of Black women on screen in the early 1970s. Though she was undeniably the most outspoken of the Black women on Sanford and Son, Paige spoke her personal politics not on screen or in magazines, but in her stand-up. This radical ambiguity proves that in order to reach stardom, Black women were often required to distance themselves from the network's television space. 
often viewers of tandem sitcoms would write letters to discuss how much they enjoy certain characters. While the letters written in reference to the character Fred Sanford were a mixture of positive and negative responses, viewer mail to Tandem Productions gathered from Norman Lear's uh, archive at Acme Productions consistently pleaded for more on Esther with comments like, the show wouldn't be a hit without her, her and Fred play off one another perfectly, she's hysterical. With such an appreciation, Paige was sometimes encouraged to go off script and improvise to make the character her own. Yet, because she was not given her due in terms of the actual writing or production at Tandem, she made sure to always remain relevant on the stand-up comedy circuit. Her Black comic persona, like the Black condition in the United States, was diffused and often distorted in the mainstream televisual popular consciousness. Dedicated fans could find the truest vision of Wanda Page in her stand-up comedy. And if you see in the uh, top two images on the, on the left, um, how she utilized Lawanda as on Esther on Sanford and Son, how she utilized the Sanford and Son idea uh, um, imagery to help sell and help uh, make a larger name for herself through her comedy. Before Sanford and Son, she was largely known as kind of a local uh, comedian for large, larger Black audiences. Sanford and Son made her national and mainstream. What Paige was able to do with her success as a Black woman in stand-up during the 19, late 1960s throughout the 1970s is a feat to which very little scholarly attention has been paid. In fact, Black women in the blue comedy scene were scarce, and rarer still were those able to transition or cross over in and out of mainstream television. Performing her blue stand-up comedy as Lawanda, the queen of comedy, while performing as Aunt Esther on Sanford and Son, Paige creates multiple persona that are filtered from one medium to the next. As the queen of comedy, she wasn't bound to network politics. Paige cursed unabashedly, talked openly about her body and sexuality, wrote, improvised, and spoke for herself. On television, Paige's Aunt Esther is an ironic commentary on her stand-up persona as she is a devout churchgoer and tough as nails realist, unafraid to state whatever's on her mind so long as it followed the good book. Although both television and stand-up are versions of Black female embodiment, Aunt Esther and Lawanda are one, are one physical body that works to show the complexity of Black female performance, one way that Tanner deemed acceptable and another where Paige was given supreme agency. For the same Black woman to have a space to speak to a national audience preaching to Fred Sanford that his home was reeking with sin and a den of iniquity, and to be able to tell, also tell a primary Black nightclub audience that she's as nervous as a whore in church offers an important contrast. According to Terrence Tucker, if Mom Mabley took on the persona of a mammy figure to, in order to subvert popular thinking about African-American women and sexuality, Red Fox became the angry Black man or the angry nigger to lend authenticity to his comic claims and boasts. I would add to this and say Lawanda Page adopted the persona of the holy roller, the black Christian woman, to complicate popular understanding of black women and their sexuality. This persona used on Sanford and Son and in her stand-up routines is her, is her hustle, as she uses her agency to gain no notoriety and no negotiate the ambiguity of the black woman. The two different but interrelated spaces are not only ironic, but clearly suggest the ambiguity of Luanda Page as a Black woman mining these two arenas. And more generally, the performative control of white male-dominated television productions. Through stand-up, Page sings natural desires of her body as opposed to basking in the quiet dignity of her womanhood, challenging the essence of a singular desexualized Black female subject that existed on television. Although the racial and gender politics at play at Tan Productions didn't reflect Black women having their say behind the scenes, the introduction of the Queen of Comedy, Luanda Page, and on Esther ground the claim that racial and gender politics must be read outside of just the text of television through charted and radical ambiguity of Luanda Page. The traditional masculine readings of Sanford and Son can be made whole. Expanding the conversation of the sitcom's pivotal role in television history and racial identity formation. Refusing to acknowledge the presence and labor of Paige on Sanford and Son ignores the historical constructions of Black, Black women's identity in television and media at large. As it exists as a cultural mainstay in television, it is crucial to also read Sanford and Son through the lens of Paige as it presents in even greater detail how this show is able to bring to mainstream audiences not just the plight of Black working poor, but an introspection of Black women's identity formation in a rapidly developing country and entertainment landscape. So I want to move forward in talking about uh, negotiating Roxy Roker and interracial marriage. So the Roxy Roker, many may know as actually the uh, the mother of Lenny Kravitz um, and side and side and and, the, and uh, married to side Kravitz and um, NBC executive, but 
you know, largely known as the mother of the uh, uh, the rock rock and roll star Lenny Kravitz. Through episode analysis, interviews, newspaper articles, and audience reception, a compelling discussion emerges about the intersection of black and white identity and the individuals of Canada Productions who helped contribute to it on television in the Jeffersons. With these contributions, the artists on the show, the black arts in particular, perform characters and situations that a great percentage of America was not ready to see on prime time. Amidst threats of violence and media backlash, these artists engage in hustle economics, excuse me, hustle economics by risking their lives and longevity of the, uh, of the show to remain employed and contribute to a grow growing black visibility on screen. So the importance I'm talking about here is that Roxy Rooker um, embodying another form of, of black womanhood and is a black womanhood that is you know, engaged in a interracial, interracial marriage and relationships, something that hadn't been seen on television beforehand. Although the history of interracial marriage as an issue is dated back much earlier, the Loving versus Virginia case is important to discuss here in regard to interracial marriage. In 1958, Mildred and Richard Loving, a black woman and a white man respectively, traveled to Washington D.C. to marry, evading their home state of Virginia's racial in integrity. Excuse me, the, the home state of Virginia's racial uh, integrity act of 1924, which made marriage between whites and non-whites a crime. After multiple arrests in Virginia for their marriage. Mildred wrote letters to the American Civil Liberties Union who aided in filing motions that Virginia state laws on interracial marriage violated the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. The matter then made its way to the Supreme Court. In 1967, the Supreme Court ruling in the case Loving versus Virginia established marriage as a fundamental right for interracial couples and struck down all U.S. state laws that prevented this right. Although laws such as these were generally upheld in the American South, which often adhered to strict Jim Crow segregation laws, 72% of the public opposed the court's decision at the time and me decreed it as judicial overreach, resisting its implementation for decades. It's no coincidence that this case impacted the reception of the film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner in 1967. Starring Sidney Poitier and Catherine Hepburn, the film was one of the few at the time to depict an interracial relationship leading to marriage, as interracial marriage historically had been illegal in most of the states uh, until Love in Virginia, just six months prior to the film's release. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner was an attempt to normalize interracial relationships by spreading a liberal consciousness against a backdrop of civil rights movements. Just eight years after this revolutionary Supreme Court decision, the Willises entered the public eye on primetime television as the Jeffersons. Similar to the Lovings, the Willises, Helen and Tom, are a married Black woman and a white man. However, their placement in the more liberal urban North keeps them from much of the de facto segregation experienced by the former. Interracial marriage between Helen and Tom is consistently poked fun at by the show's protagonist, George Jefferson. Although a sitcom stands for a fictitious imagination of reality, the, inter the interactions of the Willises as the first interracial marriage on television represent a subset of America whose story was finally being told. In a Television Academy interview with the Jefferson's producer, George Sunga, he remembers vividly Norman Lear saying to Roxy Roker and Frank Cover, who plays Roxy Roker's uh, wife, uh, uh, Frank Willis, Excuse me. Uh, he remembers vividly t Lear saying uh, to Roxy Roker and Frank Cover before the Jefferson's pilot, you must be able to kiss each other and mean it. The presence of Roxy Roker on Jefferson's reimagines her previous television identity. Roker, Roker first worked as a reporter for the NBC affiliate station in New York, where her husband, a white man, Cy Kravitz, was an executive. This local recognition, along with her career in the Negro Ensemble Company, and appearances in off-Broadway theater launched her career into the public affairs television space. As the host of one of the first Black public affairs television programs, Brooklyn's Inside Bedford Stuyvesant, Roker firmly placed herself as an advocate and interlocutor for the Black community and Black culture. With the dual goal of showcasing the area's attractive buildings and public spaces and of highlighting both the possibilities and challenges faced by the predominantly Black community, Inside Bedford Stuyvesant represented a microcosm of all Black communities and was a counteractive, me, counter narrative to the ghettoization discourse of the Moynihan Report. Roxy Rooker was at the center. According to Devorah Heitner, on the program, the hosts themselves transformed with the times, were starting as members of the civil rights generation who have made it. As a collegiate, excuse me, as a college educated Black woman, speaking in support of Black cultural beauty that this neighborhood possessed, Rooker was a welcome correspondent whom viewers engaged with. From trying on dashikis on screen to later wearing an afro, she engaged more and more with the prevailing moods of Black power over the course of the broadcast. 
Having Roker front and center as the ambassador speaking for this community on television was deliberate. The choice of Roker as a host with her middle-class linguistic styles and appearance was a subtle, subtle nod at uplift as a strategy invoked by elite African-Americans to counter racism by calling attention to class distinctions among African-Americans as a sign of evolutionary race progress. Hustling through different television production spaces, Roker was able to negotiate a new vision of what Black women could be on the small screen. In her real life, in her real life presentation on Inside, Inside Bedford Side Vescent, directly correlates with her fictitious role as Helen on Jefferson's as a financially well-off Black woman, demonstrating a, a new television characterization. With Roxy Roker being married to a white man in reality, her role as Helen Willis can be imagined as a peek into her real life once she departs the cultural epicenter of Bedford Avenue and Stuyvesant Avenue. Performing Helen and the backlash that would ensue in portraying an interracial marriage was all too familiar to Roker's lived experience. Giving the producers and writers at Tandem credit for their courageousness, Tandem used the very first episode of the, of the Jeffersons to put forth the reality of interracial intimacy, in spite of the possible negative responses that they may receive. Even the show star, Sherman Hemsley, mentioned that everyone feared showing interracial intimacy on screen. He was particularly fearful that, of the fact that an interracial marriage would get them canceled, since no one had done it before. Yet in a very private moment on screen between Helen and Tom outside of the Jefferson's doorway in episode one, the audience inter intervenes to watch the two share a very passionate and obvious kiss. The camera oscillates from wide over the shoulder to shot to a medium shot of two center screen with Helen's arms wrapped around Tom and their lips pressed in a firm and obvious embrace. Tandem defiantly made it clear that interracial intimacy on screen was possible and they risked the cancellation of the show to prove it. <clears throat> Even riskier, Roxy Rucker worked within working within a precarious employment culture in Hollywood, engages in hustle economics by performing this action on screen amidst the threat of job security in order to negotiate a new depiction of Black women in primetime television. As a company producing five acclaimed shows at the time, Tandem Productions could afford the possible backlash towards them. Yet the actors portraying these interracial marriage, Roxy Rucker and Franklin Cover, could not afford such repercussions. They, in fact, were the ones risking their careers to make an impact and important stand. Although this interracial marriage and intimacy are accepted by most of the characters within the storyline, some of the real life audience met the side of Helen and Tom Willis on screen with abhorrence. In hate mail regarding the Jeffersons, audience members particularly chastised Lear for his filthy shows. Specifically in this case, the audience berated Lear for showing interracial marriages on, on television. A writer from Philadelphia claimed, quote, I don't know anyone married or going with a Negro, so it just isn't real life, end quote. Regardless of whether the letter writer knew any interracial couples in his circle of friends, a 1970 study of married couples that have a black wife and a white husband totaled 51,420 couples combined in the North and West sections of the United States, a 66% increase since 1960. Interracial marriage was very real. Other letters from many dis disgruntled Southern viewers were sent directly in attack of Franklin Cover, whom some saw as a disgrace to, to white men. The letters addressed the cover remarked strongly against miscegenation, uh, with collective social groups even writing directly to CBS to push for ca uh, Jefferson's cancellation. You see the letter to the right uh, as one example of the letter written from an individual from the South who um, who took a large offense at seeing um, racial imagery or interracial marriage and intimacy on screen. <clears throat> to tandem and the actors of Jefferson's and the actor on the Jeffersons, these letters made it clear that their presence on screen was even more necessary. Roker's embodiment of Helen Willis is highlighted equally as clearly at the end of the first episode when a flustered Florence pauses, stares at her Black women co-stars, and ponders aloud. So in this scene, the first episode of Florence, played by Marla Gibbs, is uh, center left. And um, center right is another, uh, they're both housekeepers or, you know, or um, um, domestics uh, who live in the, who work in the building for uh, the rich families. And, you know, uh, Louise Jefferson on the far left and Helen Wilson on the far right. So Lawrence pauses, stares at her black women co-stars and ponders aloud. You folks mind if I ask something? To Luis, you live in this apartment, right? To Helen, and you got an apartment in this building too. Well, how come we overcame and nobody told me? A clear nod to a rallying cry of resistance movements we shall overcome. This line caused a hysterical laugh from the characters on screen as well as the studio audience. 
The comedy in this line comes from the delivery of Florence and the way she's able to discuss a pivotal moment of change in an amusing tone. However, reading deeper into the line, it seems the laughter is conjured more out of a space of discomfort as the domestic workers look to the black women who have obtained wealth while the domestics have the seemingly missed their opportunity. Marla Gibbs, who plays Florence, says that this line is memorable to the Jefferson's fans to this day. To overcome meant to prevail over various injustices that the civil rights and other movements fought against. Injustices such as racial discrimination, sexism, and unfair working conditions caused protesters to shout these words as a declaration for better days to come. To Florence, seeing a black woman who is not a domestic living in a high rise demonstrated overcoming. It's not so uplifting to hear her and Diane as they still work to serve others. The symbol of overcoming is seen on the Jeffersons exists as just one example of the ways this show worked against popular understandings of black life, where black women can exist in ways of overcoming financially and as domestics. It led to a plethora of ways we saw black women's identity being fluid and not just simply static. As I conclude, I want to say tandem black artists and their sitcoms are integral to how we understand and watch television today. Part of what drew me to reflect back and, and focus on the content of these shows and, and descent of black arts in the 70s for this book were the multiple instances that contemporary black television programs subconsciously mine their roots and pay homage to this period of black television performance and transformation. Slowly given an increased access to the power of authoritative realism, contemporary black artists have reimagined and re reintroduced tan black artists to the contemporary mainstream, seen through things like uh, live from a studio audience shows hosted by Jimmy Kimmel, um, as well as images th throughout popular culture, even bringing back the previous stars who are still living for these shows. And in this way, these shows have relived and got, gained, gained a larger present day audience in a contemporary world, realizing that these shows led way to the future of black television and sitcoms in general to come. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure now to introduce the respondent, my colleague, Ken File. Ken is a prolific scholar who has written extensively on queer culture, on camp, on disaster movies, and of course, on comedy. They are the author of Dying for a Laugh, Disaster Movies and the Camp Imagination, published by Wesleyan. University Press in 2005, Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In from Wayne, University, uh, Wayne State University Press 2014, and most recently, Priya's Vulgarity, Jacqueline Suzanne's Queer Comedy and Camp Authorship, Wayne University Press, again, 2022. Ken's work has also appeared in numerous edited collections. Now, I've known Ken for about 10 years now, um, and he's one of the kindest people I've met at Emerson. A joy to be around and a pleasure to have as a colleague. Ken, thank you for uh, accepting our invitation to respond to Adrian's talk. Oh, well, thank you, Vinicius. Um, uh, that I'm humbled by uh, uh, by what you just said. And, and thanks also, uh, to both you and Maria and, and Sarah for getting me involved. And of course, thanks to Adrian for writing just such an amazing book. Um, I, you know, I, I've taken, I just have to tell you three, uh, three uh, notepads worth of notes on this book. And now I find myself not quite knowing where to start. Um, so I'm just going to run down a, a kind of a list of um, uh, ideas and uh, observations and such, and then uh, uh, and then we can take it from there. Um, the most obvious uh, thing that um, Dr. Uh, Sebro is doing in Scratching and Surviving is rethinking TV history. And along with that, I think really importantly, um, authorship um, and how authorship works and what it reveals and what it represents. And, the, and of course, the extent to which authorship uh, historically has been uh, sort of oversimplified and reduced. And of course, 
how that leads to the replication of norms such as uh, whiteness and um, uh, uh, heteronormativity and um, uh, sort of patriarchal norms. Um, uh, yeah, I, you know, I recall reading Revolution Televised by Christine uh, Akam uh, many years ago and what a revelation that book was and uh, Scratching and Surviving uh, uh, continues that and more. Um, I think the concept of hustle economics is it, it floored me the first time I heard Adri uh, Dr. Sebro talking about it, um, and uh, just reading about it as both a, a sort of framework for analyzing on screen and off screen uh, transactions is is there. It's amazing in the book, and then of course just the the possibilities for applying that to other contexts, I think, um, are, are um, inspiring. Um, I, I, it wasn't something Dr. Sebro mentioned tonight, but it's sort of, it's, it's it mentioned in the introduction and suggested elsewhere in the book that despite the cultural legacy of Sanford and Son, Good Times, and The Jeffersons, um, that these shows, and, and despite Norman Lear's kind of elevation as a, a great auteur of television, uh, that these shows also have negative representation or negative uh, legacies. Um, and even at the time that they aired, uh, as the book discusses and, and other um, uh, work on these shows discuss, uh, you know, the, the shows were uh, highly criticized for in different ways um, uh, by the Black press and in some cases the mainstream press for being stereotypical and um, overly simplified representations of Black life in America. And so this is a book that uh, I, I was thinking of Raquel Gates's double negative uh, at times reading Scratching and Surviving because it is a kind of reclaiming of these negative texts or ambiguously negative texts um, and doing that through exactly what Raquel Gates is talking about in terms of exposing labor, exposing Black work. Uh, uh, black labor um, as a means of uh, appreciating uh, these programs. And so um, Dr. Sebro talks about um, uh, just the vitality of paratexts, you know, these kind of uh, uh, texts that circulate uh, the programs, uh, such as interviews and um, uh, other kinds, uh, you know, a publicity material and and uh, just, you know, any number of uh, intertextual uh, um, uh, statements about these shows. Um, uh, you know, going back to Revolution Televised, one of Akam's uh, uh, ideas uh, is that a lot of Black programming conveyed to black audiences, hidden transcripts, that's Akam's uh, term, that um, uh, spoke to black audiences differently than uh, uh, others in the audience. And, um, you know, this is a book that just through this amazing research, and pardon me for overusing the word amazing, but the research is just breathtaking and, um, just bringing out all of this evidence from interviews to contracts, analyzing contracts, um, uh, you know, presents just a wealth of other texts uh, through which we can appreciate the aesthetics and historical significance of the Jeffersons and Good Times and um, Sanford and Son, and, and even, I suppose, to some extent, um, 
Oh, geez, the Gary Coleman show, who's uh, uh, Different Strokes, of course, uh, which is the last chapter uh, or the conclusion, uh, concluding chapter. Um, I, you know, I also saw beautiful possibilities for extending this into other areas of sort of collaborative authorship. Uh, you know, one one um, point that Dr. Sebro made is that, you know, the word hustle has um, loaded connotations and meanings, particularly uh, with, uh, with within, I suppose, white culture about black culture uh, and the hustler as a kind of negative figure. Um, and it struck me that uh, Jew, uh, Jews are, are also beset with stereotypes related to hustling. And it just strikes me there's an opportunity to maybe investigate uh, more, if that's possible, evidence of a kind of uh, Jewish Black collaborative authorship as contentious as it might have been at times. But I, 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 I find that uh, fascinating. Um, uh, and I suppose if I were to talk about the, uh, among my favorite parts of the book, it's just the, the, the Lawanda Page uh, discussion um, with uh, Lawanda Page played Aunt Esther, as, as Dr. Sebro talked about on Sanford and Son, and just going into uh, her comedy history, as well as the intersection of her kind of underground comedy career and her very mainstream comedy career on Samford and Son. Um, and it just, you know, that's yet another kind of avenue that I think we could take to understanding uh, performance and cultural context and um, um, labor and creativity uh, within television and perhaps even other media. I, you know, I could go on. I, I, I have so many notes here, but I think I'll stop and uh, just uh, uh, say thank you, uh, uh, Adrian, for writing this book. And um, and I can't wait to hear what other folks have to say and ask about it. So. It's always a pleasure seeing you, Ken. I, I thank you for your words. Um, you know, after reading your work and talking about your work through our comedy sig, and now kind of coming back full circle, you talking you talking with me, engaging with me with mine. I, I just really appreciate it. And yeah, I think this is good. Some things you would say, I did want to like uh, just comment and be conversation with some of the things you said, particularly, yeah, um, looking at everything I looked at as far as you know promotional material, um, budgets, scripts, um, contracts, all these things. It's like I tell my students and like I, all of us in, who are who do media studies work as well too that the um, setting the image is we're at a time now where setting the image is is, is not enough just the image is, just what's on screen isn't enough we have to look at largely what makes on screen possible um, how is on screen received and then we could also then we could add what we see on screen after that but also what's the culture surrounding these things um, and that was so important to me right to be think about. The nuances of why someone like John Amos was actually fired from the show and what he stabbed stood for and being able to find the contracts and inner office communication to tell how and why he was fired they had like a little, little timeline of how many meetings he missed all these things culminated in understanding like you know there was a system at place here that was kind of working against um what he was trying to do and kind of working to push him out because they didn't want him there in the first place so when you think about the culture surrounding these things and versus just watching them, we may seem, oh, he's written off the show. No, there was a larger and deeper storyline there about creative restrictions and about what happens when you dissent, especially from someone like Norman Lear, who has such a, a, a huge power in Hollywood. You know, you can be blacklisted. You, you can be, you know, uh, be very difficult for you to find jobs because the company is going to choose to work with Norman Lear versus any other actor or any anybody else, especially in this moment. So what's the culture surrounding this? And with that, how difficult was it for folks to, I think, even looking at now, audiences now, looking back on shows then, it's very easy to say what a, and I, I, if you see in the in the book, I don't really say positive or negative, you know, imagery or, or stereotypes, because looking back in this moment now, it's easy for us to say, oh, that was negative, I can't believe they did that. But looking at these folks, a lot of these folks, this is, a this is their job, their livelihood. So the ways that they 
hustled and maneuvered within the system to get notoriety, then being able to hold it over the leader's head like like uh, Red Fox did. After, after three seasons, I have enough power to say, I'm going to walk away if you don't do this because the, he knew the show was him, right? So these things, what it takes to get this agency is struggle and sacrifice and obviously proving that you're good enough, right? And a lot of folks didn't have that ability. So what's at stake when you um, don't get that chance to do that? And what do you have to do in order to you know, remain employed, to remain getting a paycheck? So much of this is about labor. And oftentimes that labor had to do with them hating a role, but they'll talk about why they hate it outside of the space. That's just as powerful because they're realizing that they're doing this as a way to move forward for those who come after them, but also their politics are being known in those hidden transcripts, like you mentioned, like through Akam's words. Um, so I think it's so important to, when looking at any imagery, to talk about the culture surrounding it and these kind of pieces of ephemera that exist that help explain, you know, why this ex why this image um, resulted how, how it was and how we were able to consume it. So I just thank you for your engagement and I appreciate you uh, reading the book. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you both for the wonderful talk and response. I would love to open this up to questions, comments from our community here, whether in the chat or you can raise your hand and unmute in orderly fashion. Asha, go for it. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this great, I'm really excited about your book. I'm looking thank forward to reading it. And I have to tell you just today, I taught George Lipschitz's essay. So this feels like a beautiful gift to me <laughs> at the end at the end of the day. Um, thank you. Um, my question for you was exactly, I, I wanted to hear more about specifically what you were just speaking about, which is um, this kind of uh, authorship, but also a, a sort of collaborative move towards, uh, I know there are no black writers on these shows, right? There were only um, uh, black talent. Um, but yet, for example, Esther Rolls was, I, I know, very vocal about her opposition to what was happening with Good Times. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how actors own resistance yes. to certain kinds of writing would actually come back to the writing room. If you were able to see some way in which that was, that actually moved the needle a little. Yes, definitely. Thank you for that question. Um, so uh, black writers actually did come a bit, come 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 later on and uh, specifically in Sanford and Sons where the black writers how you have probably had the most prominence. Um, so around season, so Sanford and Sons season one, uh, Sanford and Sons is a, is a um, adaptation of the British show Steptoe and Son. So it's really just a black family based in Watts versus a black family in um, in London, in a kind of in a, in a very poor area of London. Sorry, a white family in a very poor area of London. They just transferred it over to a black family in Watts. So the first season of all of uh, Sanford and Son is literally the same scripts of Steptoe and Son, just with black people in a new community and folks had issue with that they love the timing of red fox red fox at this point he is known as the the king of party records he at this point throughout the 50s and 60s had nearly hundreds of you know records that he made doing stand-up stand-up comedy so for him his timing the comedy knowing how to manipulate words and ad lib that was easy for him right so folks enjoyed that but they realized the storylines nothing about them was particularly black right um you live in watts you know, uh, talk about what the community is like there. So really what happened in this case uh, around the second season, once Red Fox had some, you know, he, he talked to Norman Lear and the, well, actually, Bud Yorkin mainly worked on that show. He talked to the executives and said, you know, a lot of these words, you know, black people wouldn't say, or I wouldn't say, and he used a lot, a lot harsher terms. But uh, with that came the, uh, you know, the addition of some kind of guest writers at times. So we would see folks like Richard Pryor came in and wrote a guest episode, as did Paul Mooney, these popular uh, younger comedians of the time that, you know, grew to promise later on. Um, but the first staff writer was named Alunga Adele. He comes from, he come, came from theater and he ended up being the first uh, staff writer for uh, Sanford and Son, for the first black staff writer of the TV show period. But what that did was you started to see the changes of show. That's when season two is when it was when LaWanda Page came in and she ended up being a staple character, it's supposed to be a stand in and ended up being so beloved that she's now a recurring character. Right. So you saw this way of looking at uh, creating black communities once black writers were a part of the show. 
But the ways that they kind of wanted to cement this was Red Fox, you know, walked away from the show in the third season, um, one for seeking more writing credit and production credit, the possibility of that. But also he wanted to be paid as much as Carol O'Connor on, on the family because they're bringing the same numbers in. He's, he's the number one show on NBC. Carol O'Connor is the number one show on CBS, but their pay scale is totally different. So Red Fox left the show and with these demands in, in place um, and with these demands said that, you know, I mean, he, he jokes are always, he said he wants to be paid one cent more, right? Just to kind of stick it to Carol O'Connor. But really it was about respect and it was about honoring the same way you're honoring like what he's doing for CBS, I'm doing for NBC. But also when it comes to this writing room, um, he, he says, I don't hear myself in these, in this language that's being written for me. It's clear that it's not written from my perspective or from someone who looks like me. So with that, he uh, drew up a contract that made sure that he had a final look at all the scripts, as well as that he was able to pitch at least two episodes a season from his own writing. That was the way he put it in his, his contract. So every season when a new contract came about, he put that as a clause in his contract. Uh, Good Times, for instance, you mentioned uh, Esther Roll. She came from the show Mod. She was Mod's domestic. If y'all know, have watched both shows. They made this show uh, because they realized how how popular Essa role is as in this role as domestic. Reframing it for herself, she got her own show. And when that happened, um, she said to herself, "There wasn't a husband written for her." She said, "I'm not going to do the show without a husband. I want the image of black families to be redeeming." So that's one way she took control. Because at the end of the day, even though the show didn't happen yet. They, they, she knew the show was written for her. So she has some agency already ready for the show. And when it came to the writing and issues changed, you know, it was easy to write off John Amos because they didn't want him anyway. Right. But what John Amos did um, before he was kicked off of the show, part of a season four, um, season three, excuse me, contract, uh, he created his own company called John Amos Productions. And they drafted his lawyer drafted a letter up and said, so I have a whole section of our talk that had this, but it got, it would have got too long. So I cut it, but it's in the book where he created clauses in his new contract, three specifically that said that he wanted to be a part of the writer's room and, 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 and um, see the final edits before they became to came to table reads. He wanted the opportunity to um, to write an episode a season or put at least a story treatment together. And he also wanted the ability to um, also tag John Amos Productions as part of the credits. So in this way, he's writing himself in. After three, three successful seasons, he felt like he had the agency to do so. And um, they said yes to it, but towards the end, they actually, uh, I actually found their storyline script, never became an episode, but I found the storyline script of, of the episode that he wrote. Um, I talk about it in the book a little bit, but in these ways, they're kind of rewriting themselves into production and into what we see on screen because they realize the real power is in, is in the production and behind the scenes. And part of, and if they're going to risk them, their imagery of kind of being the unasked for burden of representing the entire race, why not be that, you know, representation in the writer's room as well, where it all starts? And they realized how powerful that was and how powerful, literally, like if someone else is writing for you, that's the message that the world is getting. And John Amos and Esa Roll specifically knew how big that power was. And they wanted to take full, full advantage of it by writing themselves in that writing room. Um, he got the tail end of it. He literally, talking about hustle economics and risking jobs, he literally risked his job and lost it. But in the case of Esther Roll, um, with being no show without her, she was able to have a bit more power in the space and be able to read and like talk about certain idioms or language or jargon that's used that's very much more consistent with the African American base. Because uh, she actually went to the projects and talked to people who live in Chicago to understand what it's like to live there. That conversation brought she brought to the writing. So there are ways that they wrote themselves into it, but it took them getting a notoriety first and then being you know marketable or important enough. To, to Lear and Yorkin. So really it came down to still, Lear and Yorkin held the power of what the futures would, would be for them. Thank you for that question, appreciate it. There was another hand up. Am I seeing Others. it still? Uh, it yeah. was me. I, uh, this is a lovely talk. Thank you so much. I This is my favorite topic, sitcoms. I did get some of my undergrads to come here tonight. They. They scuttled off already, but I will report back what they had. Thank to you. <laughs> but um, I'm over at Bentley University in Waltham. Okay. And it was so interesting what you just answered, because that was kind of what I was thinking as well. What role do you think the cast had in sort of authorship? And that was sort of something Ken started mm -hmm. with. But I was thinking of um, Kristen Warner's idea that somehow 
even I was now just thinking about Red Fox and even yeah. given as already written, did he write himself into it? But you had moved over to Good Times and I did know about um, the actors leaving. I wondered, I thought that Esther Roll left and then came back. Like there yeah. was a slight period where um, it, it wasn't her story. So mm -hmm. I wondered what you knew about her, what she did to come back. Because mm -hmm. I know that it was kind of an interesting moment for the Wilona character to sort yeah. of take over. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know if you had any commentary on that, but I, you kind of answered what I was thinking about with authorship. So, cool. Yeah, definitely. And that's why, again, a large part of the book is, is it's determined that, you know, uh, Lear is heralded as he should be, as I mentioned earlier, like as the auteur, like this visionary, like especially an idea of we look at TV as kind of the producer's medium, right? There's entire books written about it. But I include them in the authorship of these shows because they're the ones who are, who are performing these roles, right? And embodying them, not just performing them. So specifically, I think we see that most clear in Sanford and Son because most people on that show are stand-up comedians first, right? So they're able to literally, what's written for them, they're able to play off of it in different ways, right? They're able to, you know, and they also know how to improvise and ad lib. So you saw, you know, I would have a script right here and watch the episode and I'm like, wait, that's not written there, but it's ways that Red Fox and Paige reutilized the words, made it more fit to their comedic style, how they performed it, how they literally use their body, contort with it. That's how they become authors because they're really making a story their own. Not there's not what, what was written in the writer's room. They're making something totally different. Even if the words are the same, how they perform them, how they how they use them in tonality, that changes everything, right? And um, even with that, um, Luanda Page couldn't didn't know how to read scripts. They almost kicked her off because she didn't know how to read scripts. And Red Fox said, you know, if you leave, if you take her off, you have to kick me off too. That's how much power he had, right? And he's the one who got her hired because he knew her talents. They were friends since middle school. This is a whole story around it. Whereas, yeah, it's um, so that their their power and their their ability to perform as even some of the you know extras in the show, they're all coming from vaudeville, you know, and they're all coming from that space of literally a stage in them having to entertain everyone. So having a camera there to them was nothing really. Um, they went through some of the harshest stages before, so that that they occupied the authorship by literally, all right, this was written for me. Let me perform it my way that you would never even have imagined. And in the states of like, you know, Esther Roll, she's like from a more classical tradition. She comes from theater, the Negro Ensemble Company, like Roxy Rooker as well, too. So they're coming from the, the performance, you know, the dramatics. And we could see that in the right in, in the actual performance that she does as well. But as far as Esther Roll, she had the same issues that John Amos had. But as I mentioned, they couldn't kick her off because she is so much the soul of the show. So in the fifth season, actually, she had a breaking point for how they were writing, you know, the JJ character specifically. So she chose to leave. And she came back in the sixth season on her own volition. Um, they didn't have the, the ability to take her off because she is. But like their season five had already had a had a had a green light. And that's when you yeah, the Wilona character. They wrote in, you know, Dan Jackson as Penny. They gave JJ an even more elevated. And actually, I admit those. Just, I hate that season, those seasons, because of like, you know, so much of the core is gone of what the show was about. Um, and then she came off to end the season when she realized it was the last season. She felt that she wanted to end it the right way with her in it. So uh, her leaving, coming back is another agency that no one else probably could do because of how much she meant to this show as like a, literally the backbone of it. Um, so yeah, that just proves the ability for her to leave, come back and still be welcomed and for them to rewrite for her because of her. Um, no one else could have had that, 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 Probably just her and Red Fox can do that, really, in these shows. And when it comes to, you know, Jefferson's and a lot of this stuff, they're in the tail end of like, um, I call it kind of this, it's all a narrative, narrative of racial identity through tandem. And so they're all Black communities in San Francisco and in good times. Jefferson's is like a Black community kind of mixing into a white community and it's white, white, rich space. So that's when the writing changes a bit. But also you see a lot change as far as like the business of tandem changes here. Uh, a year into the Jeffersons is when Bud York and Norman Lear split up. Tandem still exists, but those two are no longer are there. So that's why I kind of end the book there because I, those two are tandem in my in my definition. But what you see what happens with that show is that after the first season, they stop leaning on the kind of the the racial jokes and they start leaning more into like you know uh, community cohesion and like kind of um, more harmony in black and white relations, especially with like you know the uh, the Willises and and um, and George Jefferson's character. 
so much changes when the when the show kind of breaks apart well the, when the company breaks apart in that way so i ended there because the authorship that exists even in the jeffersons uh isabel sanford was the one who was like the really the pillar like louise jefferson of that show they brought in george jefferson and he became the star but the show really really was set because isabel sanford and her you know being crossing over from um on the family to the jeffersons as you know all these shows are connected except for sanford and son they're all connected and they're all crossovers and from one another so really the black women are, are the are the basis of all these shows but really their power exists differently right you know uh, in, the, in the sitcom history now that yeah. you say that i feel like the women are hustling in the family yes to negotiate power over kind of um but i don't know they're sort of trumpian men they're yeah, like yeah. falsely dominant men who think they're in power and the show ultimately has this undercurrent of the women asserting power mm -hmm. while sort of placating these arrogant male characters Absolutely. who are very humorously arrogant. Like even Absolutely. on Esther, you know, and the women are very memorable in these shows. Often the kind of characters that are maybe seen as secondary characters, but are primary in people's memories of the show. Like on <laughs> Esther is so memorable. Yeah. And Florence is so memorable. Um, you know, a lot of the women stand out, but in and when Flo when um the spin-off happens from Maud, it's very much like a gender issue of her getting her own show. And Absolutely. Moving on. yeah. So interesting. Thank you yeah. so much. Of course, no problem. Yeah. And I think that this is an idea that the women too, like in looking at um the Jeffersons, right? The way that they brought in um Sherman Hemsley, they asked Isabel Sanford first, like do we have permission? Like, do you, do you like him enough to continue working with him? Like it was, she had that much, like they respected her that much. Right. And then obviously when it came to the shows, like, you know, uh, having a show where the woman's a lead in this moment is, 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 especially in black community is very, it's hard to see. So even though SRO was a lead, you saw how they kind of tried to smoothly transition that lead to sometimes Jan, uh, John Amos, largely JJ's character, right? They kind of complicated it, but we all know who the show's center was, like the first person who's listed, that's the role. But they, you know, they find ways to kind of push the women kind of to the side, but you can't imagine any of these shows without these women, right? Even Sanford and, the and male, Also the male characters make a lot of poor decisions. That yeah, the women, women are usually the, <laughs> they're usually the moral, they're, they're usually the moral center of these shows for well, sure. They're more practical. Like they yeah. come up with the solution to the humorous problem caused by the male character. So Absolutely. Which I really didn't think of till right now. So yeah. kind of interesting. <laughs> thank you. Of course. We have a little more time if there are remaining questions. Uh, could I? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for a really fascinating uh, talk. I was just uh, uh, curious, um, how did you get access to the Tandem archives uh, and permission to uh, to use them? I, I It's certainly mm -hmm. possible for me to imagine that uh, you know, Norman Lear was still alive, that there might be stuff in there that they wouldn't especially uh, yeah. want to be aired. So. Yeah, uh, timing and, and and luck. Honestly, I tell a lot of my students, like, look, um, someone gives you an access to an archive, you take it because you never know what could happen to it. So uh, I think it was 2017. Um, I'm kind of like cold emailing. I have a friend of a friend who's like, a, I work at this prostitute program and he is, the, the chair of a prostitute program is a um, producer. I think he worked on Revenge of the Nerds. Like, you know, people in Hollywood know each other, right? So I'm like, hey, would you happen to know anyone? This is why I'm still in like the dissertation, like proposal stage, perspectives, trying to figure out what I'm writing about. Or oh, I knew I write about this, but I didn't, I didn't think I had enough weight to carry into like a larger dissertation. I said, do you know anyone that knows like, you know, Norman Lear or like Bud Yorkin's family? Because Bud Yorkin, I think recently passed or like had just passed, I believe. Um, he had some papers at UCLA. So did Edward Stevenson, who was like the set of production designer for Tandem. So which was local to me because I went there. But I wanted to try to get an interview with Norman Lear. I know his his, docu his uh, biographic biography was coming out. Um, I wanted to get a chance to interview him, so because he was still moving around and active. So he sent me some like you know email addresses he knew from some of his contacts. Um, I emailed everyone I could think of that was on the list, and I was you know said I look I'm writing this you know uh, book. I love your work, and you have to kind of you know give the praise and embellish, you know, and I want to really, you know, give praise to this moment, these shows, 
Um, can we meet? Meeting with him was extremely difficult. Uh, it was like six months on hold and it wouldn't happen because he was sick. It was still so many things differently, but they're like, oh, but we actually have, we're moving locations. And this is like, we have a Beverly Hills location. We have a lot of like old materials there. I said, I wanted scripts. And at that point I wanted just scripts and um, really that's it. I didn't know what else I was looking for. And I was told that, oh, we have this kind of archive of, of, of stuff here. We're going to move it to, to Sony in a couple of months. So if you want to get it, like here's these two weeks, you can, you can come look at it. And um, I went there one day, walked in, assuming it was going to be three, four boxes. It was a room of 60 boxes and I uh, kicked my shoes off. And I was there nine to five all week. I uh, missed class, but my professor understood. I'm like, look, I, I can never get access to this again. Um, and I went through everything and I was like, oh, this, and it clearly was things that they didn't really realize what was in there. And I think that was the thing. I was like, all right, let me make sure I save this email, give me access, got permission for everything, right? But I realized that they were about to categorize this off to, to Sony, which would have made access to it, as you all know, much dif more difficult, much more kind of restricted. Things may have been deleted, taken off, who knows? But I had a free access. And even the assistants who worked in the building didn't realize like kind of what was in there really. So they're like, oh yeah, here's the room. If you need coffee, whatever, come out here. You have till the end of the day. So I spent all day going through each box and realizing like I was able to at one point literally put things on the floor and make a narrative out of them. Like, especially with this timeline of John Amos, how and why he got fired. There was inner office communication saying, John missed another meeting today. Uh, here's John's new contract from his lawyer. Like I have all these things in connection that made a story of why and how he was fired and what came up to that. Even a list of like grievances and dates he missed doing table reads. And I'm just like, I shouldn't, I don't know if I should have access, access to this, but this is, this is something that I could make a story out of. So it was the timing of that, honestly, and, and sending these cold emails and never realizing what someone may have. I've had friends who found things, who, who found archives in someone's garage, right? Sending these, I tell students all the time, especially in this this stage, that if you think someone may have an idea of something or like find these cold emails, because you'll run into something sometimes. And I think that I, the timing was good because, yeah, I would doubt my ease of going through all these things or having access to them would have been what it was if it was once it was sent off to Sony in this larger institution, you know, when things were much more difficult. But yeah, they they, they said, look, take what your your time with everything. And I and I did. And um I've been in other archive spaces where you can't even come in with you can only come in with a, a piece of paper and a pencil. Right. And this one I had freedom of everything. I could take pictures, I can do whatever. They had no restrictions on anything. So the timing couldn't have been more perfect, honestly. And then a year later, this um, live and studio thing came out. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm onto something at least. Or And then another year later, the Blackish episode where, where they reimagined as Good Times characters came out. So I was like, okay, this is, I got to publish this now. So timing ended up being really good, but really seeing those emails and fully, I had no idea this would ever be an archival work, but I love that it was because I was able to create a narrative and a story based off different things. And as, as Ken mentioned earlier, the, ephem the ephemera that exists, the paratext that exists outside of just the show is what I think makes this book what it is because um, how popular culture may be a black press like Ebony or Essence or Jet Magazine or Time or TV Guide, they talk about the shows differently. So I'm gonna bring it, both of them in conversation here and talk about why they talk about these shows differently, what's to get from both of these and what they're trying to say about these shows. So bringing in your contracts, I can also have a more deeper understanding of why I'm watching on screen, why Red Fox decided to leave. Oh, how much he's getting paid versus how much Carol Connor's getting paid. I have the evidence here, what the money looks like. And the fact that I was able to figure out that Red Fox, uh, what he did to bring a lot of his other folks from vaudeville circuit up, he offered them, you know, he said, hey, Norman, can we get like some, you want, you need some extras? Cool. Bring my friends in, give them each $500 for the day. And they would come and be extra on the show and they would leave. That was his way of like bringing his community onto the show as well too. But I only know that from reading these like script notes in which Red Fox kind of requested it as a possibility, right? So you find these things based off of kind of putting time in the archive. So that's why I was I was so scared and resistant to it. But now it's just like, um, it's such a great place because you can weave together narratives that create so many good stories. And so um, I'm encouraging a lot of my students who are so anti-archive to really, you know, check it out because it, it really was able to, make a story that I had no idea what it would be. And I think that without it, there would be so much more, so, be so much more speculative text 
which could be something, but um, I think having this work there uh, definitely adds to the breadth of kind of the, the business side of what this is too. I think that that is the perfect um, note on which to end talking about the labor and your hustle in the archives. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Sebro, Adrian. Thank you very much, Dr. Feel, Ken. And thank you all for being here and for staying until the bitter end. Thank you, Sarah, again. And um, we hope to see you all at the next Boston Cinema Media Seminar. Thank you for having me. Appreciate you so much. Have a great Thank night. You. Congratulations Bye. on the book. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. I think I hope that's okay that I went ahead and ended it. It seemed like things were Oh yeah, no, for sure. I think it was a good spot to yeah, yeah. Dying down. Yeah. And um, you know, that was just riveting and really fascinating throughout. So you gotta stop the recording, is that cool right there? Or yeah, sure, sure. Let me see.